Okay, first things first, I have to give a thank you to DreamWorks, who um, made that movie. That clip came from Rise of the Guardians. And anybody that took the time to come out to our family movie night in December, last December when we showed Rise of the Guardians, you had to see this coming, right? I mean, as you were watching that movie, um, you know what? A few people were like, this has all the makings of one of those Barry's crazy sermons. As a matter of fact, as you begin to look at it, you could easily see that, you know what? You could make a whole series out of this. Guess what? That's what we're going to do. Now, for those who didn't come and take advantage of that wonderful movie, which is a great movie to show, um, let me catch you up on the story. The world in the movie is being encompassed by darkness. Boy, doesn't that fit with where we live today? And as you watch that globe and all those lights are flickering, all of the lights of belief are going out one by one. Boy, that sort of fits too. That black shadow you saw is none other than Pitch Black was the name they gave him. And we all know him better as the guy that brings the bad dreams and lives underneath our beds and tries to scare us. And we call him the boogeyman. And well, um, the movie is focused on the idea that the children are in trouble. But for this series, let me just kind of bring you into it, because usually when I think the children are in trouble, oh great, this is going to be another, another sermon series about how we're supposed to focus on the children. The children don't think about them in the calendar age, not that they meet some kind of requirement. As a matter of fact, for this sermon series, here's the children I'm talking about. You find them in John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children not born of natural descent, nor human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. This is not a series about protecting children. Not a bad series to do, but that's not it. This is a series about us dealing with something that is at the very heart of the 2021 church. See, our churches, they're under attack by a very old adversary. And just like the boogeyman, he has got a weapon of choice. It is called fear. How many people over the past 18 months have dealt with fear? Yeah, me too. Oh my gosh. Fear of, am I going to get a virus? Fear of what's happening in my community? Fear of what's happening all around? Just fear just seems to be, again, spreading across our globe and causing us all kinds of concern. And fear, I find the definition very interesting because it is an unpleasant emotion caused by a belief, note that word, that someone or something is dangerous, likely to cause pain or is a threat. And as I look at that definition, here is what I find ironic. Fear does not get you to stop believing. It gets you to believe differently. Make sure you understand. The way fear works, it does not destroy your ability to believe. It creates a distraction. It creates an emotion. It creates what we perceive as a threat, what we perceive as danger. And it gets us to believe that that is more powerful than what we believe in. Tell me you haven't seen this over the past 18 months. As we've been bombarded with fear after fear, we just can't help but focus on unpleasant, things that are broken, things that are going wrong, things they're asking me to do, things that are not the way they used to be, things that are just, they're just unpleasant. I don't want to deal with them anymore. Um, we just can't help but focus on danger. I remember when I was a kid and my parents were always telling me, don't do that, it's dangerous. Now they realize that was just an invitation for me to try it, okay? They, they got that now. But we have become obsessed with we see danger everywhere. 
we, we see danger in going to the grocery store. We see danger in walking across the street. We, we see danger in every single thing that we do, and, and, and that's nothing but, but fear. It causes us to avoid things because we think we're going to get hurt. This goes for relationships. I don't want to get involved in a relationship. After all, what if it goes bad? I'm afraid of that. I might get hurt. I, I don't want to get involved in a church because if it goes bad, I'm going to get hurt. I don't want to do things because I'm focused on things that might damage me and pull me away. I'm afraid. It makes us see threats. I think this is big time in the church. I, I've often said we see a witch behind every rock these days. Everything is a threat. It's funny, we stopped looking at the world as a mission field and we started looking at it as a battlefield that we're supposed to win by, by, by taking up, I guess, weapons and going out there. But that's never how Jesus saw it. When Jesus looked out, he didn't see threats. What did he see? He saw sheep that were lost. He felt compassion for them. Not, he didn't see them as a threat. And that's kind of how he expected for us to see things. Now, this is not just a church issue. Let's be honest. Everybody uses fear these days. Even Jake from State Farm uses fear these days. I mean, insurance companies for years have preyed on the idea, you're afraid what will happen if this happens, so you better buy some insurance to cover yourself from it. Our government uses fear. If you don't let us take care of this, then you know what? Bad things are going to happen. We were all around last summer when all of the demonstrations happened and the violence keeps coming and coming and coming. Even this week, more violence. And every time you see violence, what do you get? You get afraid. I, I'm afraid to go do anything because something might happen. The economy has been the hot button for 18 months now. We've talked about the economy and everybody is talking about the fear. If it doesn't come back, if it doesn't work, and how, is this gonna, how am I going to support my kids? Even our health industry. It's no longer talking about how we can help you. It's be afraid. If you don't do things the way we're, you need to be afraid. Fear just seems to be running rampant. And you know what? Fear has an impact on my ability and probably your ability to be still and know who is God. I mean, when I become afraid, I can't sit still. Fear demands a reaction. Everybody knows that. It is a natural scientific thing in your body that when you're afraid, you want to get away from that which is making you fear or afraid or you want to defend against it. It's called the flight or free syndrome. The flight or flee syndrome. I can say that if I say it really slowly. And, and so we either want to get away from it or we want to battle it because that is what fear does. And while I'm doing that, I can't be still. You can't run and stand still. You can't fight and stand still. So we've been whipped up into a frenzy and we're seeing all of this fear and, and, and we're living in it. And here's the amazing thing that maybe you didn't know. Jesus taught about fear. Over and over and over, Jesus talks about this idea of fear. It's like he knew what was coming. He did. He already knew the end to the story. He understood this would become the weapon of choice. And over the coming weeks, we're going to read a whole bunch of company verses about those words, fear not. By the way, this is not a Christmas sermon. I do realize we're closer to Easter than Christmas. I got it. Okay? I, I, my calendar's fine. Okay? Trust me. I got this. All right? But for today, I just want to look at a familiar block of Scripture from Jesus. And we're going to make a few quick observations to kind of set the groundwork, lay the groundwork for what we're dealing with when we talk about this idea of fear. This is not revolutionary. This is probably a scripture that well, I know we've looked at it before, and you probably, again, have this is one of those bumper sticker scriptures. We like to put it up there. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. 
straight from the mouth of Jesus. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life or what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look, the birds of the air, they do not sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And are you not more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, and tomorrow is thrown in the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek ye first the kingdom, his kingdom, and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And as I read that, there was just something that, that leapt off the page at me. Fear manifests itself outwardly, but it's really an internal issue. When, when I think about afraid, uh, being afraid, I think about the things I'm afraid of. Okay, big dogs, not a big fan. As somebody that rides a bike a lot, not a big fan of big dogs. Okay, just not. I'm, I'm thankful for fences and borders and leashes and things like that because I'm just not a big fan. It's, it, it probably comes from an experience I had when I was a kid. I don't know. Not a big fan. But I think about the things I'm afraid of, but really fear has nothing to do with the things around me. It has to do with my internal response to the things around me. And as Jesus talks about this idea of fear, the first thing he says, he's, he talks about the idea of worry, which is to allow one's mind to dwell on difficult trouble or difficulty or trouble. Isn't that where fear starts? I begin to, to, to worry about, well, if I don't do something, if I don't take action, if I don't take out the insurance, if I don't go to the doctor, if I don't do this, if I don't, and then I start to become afraid because I begin to worry about, well, what if I don't? And I begin to dwell. And as I begin to dwell on that, you know what I can't dwell on, right? God, your mind's not designed to work that way. And the other thing Jesus talks about is this word anxious. Um, nervousness, typically about an imminent or an imminent event or something that is uncertain outcome. And so we become anxious. A lot of people suffer from anxiety. And I understand anxiety is a, is a real disorder that people have to deal with. But we become anxious over everything these days. We play the what if game like it's our life's desire to ask these questions. What if it doesn't work out the way I planned it? What do I do then? And so I become anxious, and Jesus tells us that our worry and our anxiousness, it causes us to be afraid. And I bring all of this up because what I need you to know is that while you think it's an external battle, fear is a battle of the mind. It's all in here when it comes to fear. Now, I'm not saying there aren't legitimate threats out there. I'm not saying that, you know what, we should say, well, there's no such thing as gravity, so I can jump off a building and don't go splat at the bottom. That's not the way it works. Okay, there is some fear that's really, really, really good. We taught our kids, don't touch the hot stove, and the first thing, it'll burn you. We told them, be afraid of it a little bit. It's kind of interesting. Now we're trying to teach our kids to use the stove. And now they're thinking, but it's hot. You told me don't touch it. Now you Understand, fear is a good thing but it, when it begins, but you cannot just live in fear forever. You see, since it's a battlefield of the mind, we often think fear can be changed by changing the situation. If I just change jobs, change houses, change locations, change friends, change spouses, change relationships, I'll just swap it all out and eventually all of my, my, my fear will go away. 
We go so far as to think we can um, get rid of fear by going into a battle or a conflict with it. If I can just defeat the enemy, it'll all be okay. And here's the thing, just like Pitch when he left that globe, Satan's laughing at us, folks. He's laughing at the way that we're trying to deal with our fear because we're out there and we're trying to do it as Jesus said, just like the world does it. We're trying to avoid it. We're trying to get away from it. We're trying to stamp it out. We're trying to beat fear by beating an enemy. And you know what? How's that working for you? Would you say that today you were less, you were less afraid about the world than you were five years ago? No, we're more afraid of it. Would you say that today you are less afraid of the world than you were 18 months ago? No. We're, we're buying more locks, more security, more cameras, more looks. Because why? We're afraid. But what we, the church, need to remember is what we're really focused on. Not on a world, not on the fear that's out there. It tells us in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but, a, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now, I, I've read this scripture before, and, and you need to understand, our, our enemy is not the federal government. It's not. Um, our enemy isn't the state government. Our enemy isn't a school system. Our, our enemy isn't even a world philosophy. When you boil it all down, the thing that we are most afraid of facing is the fact that there's a war going on behind the scenes, and we don't like that because I can't fight that battle, can I? I don't know that I would want to climb into a ring with Satan and go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. i got a feeling I'd be a little overmatched. It'd be like me trying to run and keep up with my son. I'd last maybe a few hundred feet. And then I'd be, <laughs> he'd be running on. I, I just can't do that. And so we keep trying to climb into the ring and fight this battle. And so today I want to take that little lesson that Jesus taught about fear. And I want to make three quick observations just to kind of get you ready for where we're headed. So observation number one, fear is short-sighted. What will you eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear? If COVID-19 showed us nothing else, it is these facts. Fact number one, we are all people that only think about today. Don't believe me? Go back about 18 months and ask yourself, where do you find toilet paper? People were going out and they were buying it by the pickup truck's load and they were raiding the stores because why? I'm afraid I'm going to run out of toilet paper. And so we went out there and then people were just hoarding toilet paper. I'm like, it's worse than a snow day in Virginia. People were just stocking up on it. And why? Because they were afraid. What do I do if I run out of toilet paper? And we didn't think about the fact that, well, what about my neighbor or the other people that, because I bought 150 rolls, there's going to be none for something. Well, that's their problem. Not my problem. They should have come to the store early. They should have gotten up at 5 o'clock in the morning and come here. That, that's their problem because we think mostly about ourselves. The other thing that, that this virus thing taught us is we are people that left to our own desires only concern ourselves with ourselves in the big picture. Think about it. I only think about today, what I need today, and I only think about what is good for me, left to my own desires. I have a very hard time keeping a worldview if my little world isn't running perfectly. And I'm talking perfectly. It doesn't take very much to get me to start thinking about just myself. It can be something as insignificant as a flat tire. Woe is me, I have to deal with a tire, a flat tire, a fix. I don't have time for this. Really? Do you know that's a minuscule problem compared to what other people are dealing with in their life? You, you get it, right? But it inconvenienced my life. Okay, it did. Um, we are people that are focused on the here and now. We are. We are a people that left all by ourselves, we only 
care about what is good for me in this moment. We're not thinking down the road a year, two years, five years, 20 years. We're not designed to do it that way. That's not what we've become. We have become a very in-the-moment kind of people. Don't believe me? Spend about five minutes today and just find yourself a news channel and sit and watch. Or if you don't like television, get yourself a newspaper. And just don't read the articles, just read the headlines. Everything is about what's happening today and how do I fix my world today. And the reason is, is because fear is short-sighted. If I can get you afraid, I will get you focused on this moment And then you're not thinking about the consequences down the road. You're only thinking about, how do I get through this moment? And Jesus knew this. He's like, why are you worried about what you're eating today? Why are you worried about what you're wearing today? I woke up this morning, I got a closet full of clothes, and I've got food in my house. What do you got left to worry about? Well, let me tell you, what do you really have left to worry about? Second observation I want you to see is um, fear is a direct result of misdirected faith. Listen to the words of Jesus. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at all the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying at a single hour to your life, and why do you worry about clothes, see how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spend, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in his splendor was dressed like one of these. If God, if God, if this is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? O you of little faith, do not worry about what you will wear, for the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Now, before you get mad at me, um, I didn't write this. It was written long before I got there. And I also want you to know, I did not say that you have a lack of faith. But fear is all about misdirected faith. In this little section of scripture, Jesus just begins bombarding the disciples with questions. It's like, why are you worried? Is not life more than food? Is the body more than clothes? Are you not much more valuable than they? Can you or any one of you add an hour to your day by worrying about your life? Why are you worried about clothes? It's interesting he keeps talking about clothes, um, about what you're going to wear. And as I listen to these questions, I almost want to put my hands over my ears and say, stop. Stop asking me questions. It's like one of those trips where you're in the kit in the car with your five-year-old. Why is the sky blue? Why do clouds move? Why is the grass green? Just stop asking me questions. Because I'm reading these and I can't answer these questions for Jesus. Why am I doing all this? I don't know. It's because my faith is misdirected. See, the question Jesus really wants us to answer is, what are you placing your faith in? Are you placing your faith in what you eat, what you wear, where you live, social structure? Are you placing your faith in the balance in the bank account? That's my favorite, by the way. I I love that. I love online banking. Oh, my gosh, this is terrible for me because I can look at my bank account all day long. I don't have to wait till I get home. Somebody spends money. I know about it right away. Yay! I can even have it alert me every time somebody spends money in the checking account. I know exactly how much. Oh my gosh, it's, it's, I've turned off a lot of those alerts because they got very destructive. Who spent money? Yeah, you get it, right? We placed our faith in so many different things, and this is what Satan is beginning to do to us because now that my faith is misdirected and I can't focus myself on God, then you get the idea that, um, well, now I'm afraid. And so um, Jesus gives us these two simple object lessons. Not complicated. And I'm going to see Jesus is giving this lesson, and they're sitting over there as a, as a fly. I don't know what birds they had in, in that land. Maybe they had pigeons or something that looked like pigeons. Or, but he looked over there and he said, you see those little flocks of birds over there? Look at what are they doing. They're eating. They don't have a garden. They don't have a credit card. They don't have a super Walmart near them. Um, they don't have any of that. But take a look. They're eating. And he probably looked over here, maybe there was like a little pot of flour. And he said, see this flour? It doesn't own a sewing machine. 
or a dye factory. It, it, it can't go to Walmart. It's stuck in one place. And look, it's closed. You see, this idea that Jesus wants you to see is that the birds and, and the flowers and, and God takes care of them and we are valued. But what Jesus is really pointing out here is the idea that I have plenty. That's what Jesus wants us to see. When it comes to God, God says to us, I have plenty. Plenty of what? What do you need? What do you need? You need a little, a little more faith in your life? Well, just go to God. You, you need a little more trust in your life? Go to God. I have plenty for whatever your need is. And then he reminds them, I haven't forgotten you. God didn't forget about the church in 2020. I want to tell you something. There were times in 2020 I honestly thought that maybe God went on vacation, okay? He just checked out and decided to go wherever he goes on vacation because I'm like, what did you do? Like push the autopilot button and go somewhere else? God, do you not see what's going on? Barry, that's your fear talking. I haven't forgotten you. I numbered the hairs on your head, less to count these days, but they're still numbered. I wonder if he, count, if he has the one number that I've lost, because I'd like to go back and find those at some point. But he says, I've got it all under control. I haven't forgotten you. I'm in control if you let me. Jesus will never fight you for the wheel to your life. You have to give it to him. And you know, that's what fear does, is fear makes me grab that wheel and wrap my knuckles around it and hang on tight. But Jesus comes back and says, when you do that, again, remember, I didn't write this, okay? Jesus says, for the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. A pagan, one who has little or no religion, or who delights in sensual pleasures, or materials, or goods, or irreligious, or hedonistic activities. <sighs> that's what he compared us to when we were afraid and we began to just chase things. See, in Jesus' opinion, fear that creates worry comes from us not believing God will come through. And folks, that hurts. When, when I'm afraid and I begin to chase for myself, really I am looking at God and says, I don't think you're going to come through for me. Ouch. Jesus goes on and says, since we are afraid God is not going to, that God is going to let us down, what do I do? I take it on myself. Double ouch. That hurts. But it's true. Not that I will never be afraid, but when I become just fear-driven and everything is about what I'm afraid of and what's going to bring tomorrow and what I have to do just to survive this life, Jesus says, you've just got the wrong thing going in your life. You're afraid. And you're not afraid of the boogeyman. You're not afraid of the government. You're not afraid of the school system. You're not afraid of society. Just make sure you understand what you're afraid of. You're afraid God's not big enough. That's it. You are afraid God is not big enough to get you through whatever you just encounter. Ouch. That's what Jesus is telling them. We're doing it the way the world does it and expecting God to respond. And then he goes on and he closes up his little section here, and this is where we're going to kind of close our sermon. Stopping fear is about knowing God. Boy, that kind of fits in the be still and know that I'm God thing. Stopping our fear is about having an understanding. It says, but seek first his kingdom. Stop chasing the world and start chasing the kingdom. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Stop chasing the rules of the world and start chasing God. And all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Stop worrying about what is going to happen and start paying attention to what God is doing. God did not stop doing things because somebody announced coronavirus or COVID-19 or whatever we called it. God did not stop doing things because the social unrest in our society. God has not stopped. The problem is, is we've stopped being faithful because we've become afraid. We began to allow other things to become 
our focus. And I find this good, good news for us because that means if this is how we get away from just being afraid, then there is a really easy solution on how to stop fear. Stopping fear is um, not focused on this life, but on life. Jesus tells us in John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except for me. If we get our focus off of the fear and back on where we need to be, and that is Jesus, then you know what? That solves all the problems. Everything we've got. And I know what you're thinking. How? Barry, there is just so much going on in this life, and, you know, they tell us this might get worse before it gets better, and, and you know what, I've waited so long. How do I go about changing my perspective? Here's what we have to do. You better make room, because we're about to have some company. We're going to spend the next six weeks calling in the Guardians. No, not mythical characters, not Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny or the same. We're going to go back and we're going to look at God's Word and we're going to look at the things that God gave us to help us defeat the fear in our life. Ironically, most of them fit with these really cool characters that, that DreamWorks so lovingly put together for us. And if they're going to give me an outline, I'm going to use it. We're going to go back and we're going to assemble the things that God gave us. Because I want to tell you something. This is a call. Let the light go out. This is a call for the church to stand up and it is time for us to come back. It is time for us to come back to the things that God called us to do to reach a world that is living in fear, but they're living in fear because they are lost and dying without a relationship. And it is time for us to get busy and come back. Yes, the world is not totally safe. I get it. It's never going to be totally safe. We want to be responsible and reasonable with what we're doing, but it is time for us to get over the fear and get back to doing the things that God called us to do. And it's never going to be perfect. Never was. Never will be. But you know what? We've got the tools to do it if we just call in the things that God has already given us. So for today, here's where I want to leave you. Two simple words. Fear not easy to say. Fear not, because in that scripture that Jesus gave us, he said, you know what? God already knows what you're afraid of. And here's the thing. If we let him, God is willing to help you through those fears. But here's the point. If you let him, if you allow him to come into your life and be your guide,